Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Money Talks. My name is Hugh Meyer. Hope you're doing well. Uh, super excited to be here today. Just to remind everyone again, you know, we established Money Talks uh, several months back to connect lead entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business experts to small business owners and talk about how they've been thinking creatively during these very disruptive times. And again, like I said, very excited today to have my guest, a colleague and friend of mine, he is a published author with actually a new book coming out soon. Uh, he is the CEO of the Gold Hill Group. Um, and I'd like to bring on Jonathan Goldhill. Jonathan, how are you today? Hugh, thank you very much for having me. I'm pretty pumped up. Yeah, it's a, it's a new day. It's a gray day out in the moment, but, you know, we know the sun's going to burn through and we've got to bring <laughs> that energy to our clients today, give them some love. Absolutely. Uh, that's, a, that's a great starting point. So I you know, get super excited. You and I met, uh, maybe it could have been a year ago now, so time flies, but uh, you know, always look forward to reading your posts on LinkedIn. You're, you're always a great resource to, to small business owners. Um, you, 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 know, you have a particular focus as far as you, know, you talk about on LinkedIn, you're guiding next generation leaders. Maybe you can start off a little bit about your background and then talk a little about that as well. Sure. Yeah. I love to talk about the next generation leader who I think is a millennial and I think millennials are really taking over the workplace. But uh, let me start with my background. And uh, I guess the, the history really is that I'm born out of a very successful, large family clothing business uh, based out of North Philadelphia, headquartered in New York City started by my grandfather and his brothers and their father. And it was basically a men's suit club, a business where, you know, I think probably starting at the ages of nine and 11 or 11 and 13, my grandfather and his brothers were peddlers on the streets. And, and it's a rich history, I think, uh, um, as a family of Jewish immigrants into, I'm a third generation American, but I was very, very proud of what my grandfather, really a self-made man, was able to achieve. He was a, an accomplished artist. He was a, a fun and jovial person, and he led a great life, and he was very successful and was very philanthropic. And so that business basically, uh, did it made it through the third generation, but at that point, it was just the in-laws. My, my father, so that was his father-in-law because it was my maternal grandfather. So my, um, my father got into the business. Unfortunately, he passed at a very young age of 35. Oh, wow. And there was only one other son-in-law that got into the business. So it really struggled it, it, through the third generation. Um, fortunately, they sold it to a, a large conglomerate. Mm -hmm. Um, and they continued to operate it for the next two decades. Wow. Getting lifetime employment contracts, which is really unheard of today. But <laughs> so, so the reason why I tell that whole backstory is because I think it's a rich fabric for who I was. It, it gave me a certain amount of financial freedom at a very young age, which allowed me to pursue what it was that I love to do. And I pursued a lot of things, personal growth, personal development, um, and then I started getting involved in entrepreneurial businesses. I started an art, art and clothing company in Venice. Um, I had a few other businesses. And then I would gradually was doing consulting. And I went back to school to get an MBA in entrepreneurship and consulting at University of Southern California. And that's really when I launched my career as a consultant to entrepreneurs. And that was over 30 years ago. And I this great and deep affection for family businesses because most businesses and most jobs and most employment and the most gross domestic, you know, uh, like two thirds of the gross domestic product is coming from family owned businesses. And look, 96% of all businesses, you are under a million dollars in revenue. Right. And so that's a monumental feat to be in the top four or 5%, let's say, uh, to be over a million because most of them are are small. They're pizzerias, they're dry cleaners, they're, um, you know, they're the neighborhood local florists and, and whatnot. So really to find those businesses that are the job creators and the next level and to invest my time and energy into that millennial, typically a millennial because they're more coachable. And as a coach, I want someone who's who's open to ideas, who's going to read, who wants to learn, who wants to grow, and who's into who recognizes that having a paid mentor 
makes sense. So I think, you know, the millennials today are the most determined, the most driven. Uh, I believe that there's a population bulge, you know, the, there was the baby right. boomer and then there was now the, the millennials. Right. And so they're, they're the next generation of people that are going to be running entrepreneurial companies. And there's more, you know, people of color, more black owned entrepreneurs, you know, than there were baby boomers. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great new world out there. And so finding those people, helping them, guide them, uh, give them the path to freedom that I was lucky to be bestowed with at a young age. Um, that's my, that's my calling. So that's how I got into it. Yeah. The, thank you for that background. I don't think yeah. I ever knew about the Philadelphia, uh, start on um, that. Yeah. I, cause that, that's where I was born and raised. Um, so I could appreciate that. Uh, a lot of great hardworking people from, from Philadelphia, a lot of great businesses got started there. Um, and yeah, like, you know, like I said, this is a podcast for resources and, and you're an amazing resource. Uh, I know firsthand because I interviewed one of your clients, yeah. <laughs> um, Justin yeah. White, uh, up North. And I know, you know, he's done amazing things with his, with his business. And the, a lot of that is a testament to kind of your coaching because, you know, his business may, it was in somewhat in flux when he took it over and he, uh, you know, with your guidance has really ramped up that business. And he's that definition that you just described of this ne kind of next gen business owner. Yeah. So he actually was kind of the inspiration uh, for the book. Um, you know, every writer needs to have a muse right. and that's someone that he is either thinking about or writing to. And, and Justin was my muse. When I met Justin, it was 2015. And uh, they had about uh, 15 employees. They were they were going between like 10 and 18, uh, you know, averaging maybe 15 employees. And now he's uh, close to or pushing 100 employees. Okay. And it was really a, a, tr a transition. It was, um, he was lucky enough to have a dad who was really supportive and not going to hold on to the business and hold on to the leadership and power and keep it small. Right. Um, unfortunately, his parents were not that supportive initially about bringing a coach on. His mom was particularly um, antagonistic <laughs> to it, I think. And uh, you know, eventually, like, it, and it wasn't much longer after that that we were negotiating an exit for uh, for her uh, for his mom, who ended up actually getting divorced from his dad, and it gave him kind of a a, a runway, right. To, really grow the business. And I mean, we did a lot of things together, but like one of the first things we needed to do was replace the financial talent because it wasn't really that strong. Cause you know, Hugh, I see this a lot in small family owned businesses where it's literally a mom and pop right? and not to stereotype, but let's just say it's in the construction business. So the man is out in the field doing the, the field work, the laboring, the managing the people and, and the, the, the spouse, his uh, wife, is in the office and she's learning QuickBooks and she's doing payroll and HR and hiring and managing the office staff. And, you know, oftentimes they're not very well trained and anyone can learn QuickBooks pretty easily. Um, so the books can get uh, messy pretty quickly. Right. <laughs> and I've had to put, bring in more than uh, a few financial guys um, who are colleagues to me to help clean up the books of these companies and then eventually help them put in the right financial talent. But uh, once we really s settled on the right financial talent, like it was really smooth or it, it you know, we had the wind at our back for a right. long time thereafter because we had great, great numbers, great measures. We could set goals. We could start attracting people and start paying, you know, rewards because we really knew what we were making. So. I mean, it's a whole long story. I could continue to going into it, but you probably already covered a lot with Justin. Yeah, but no, it's 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 a great reminder of just you know what you do and the power of your work, and uh, you know he has you know and and he has a great culture uh, in his business. Yep. So, like you yep. said, you and I could sit there and talk probably at length about that and others. But I wanted to, we wanted to spend some time, you know, talking about the disruptive successor, your book. Mm -hmm. And yep. I guess what, well, you know, what was the genesis of that and, and what is, you know, the definition? So uh, the genesis was that, you know, I wanted to start to put myself out as an authority 
on a, a subject on a, and in a niche that I could own and would be my niche. And so there's a lot of coaches. Increasingly, more coaches are entering the, the, the business coaching world. And so um, developing a book, which would be an authority marketing piece that would speak to my ideal client, um, I thought would be a really powerful thing. I mean, you know, we're not getting out and getting and networking these days with business cards, but coaches are, have books. And I wanted to have somewhat of a playbook that I could put in front of someone and say, like, this is your path for going forward. And so the disruptive successor is typically a millennial next generation or second gen CEO or up or soon to be CEO of a family business. Typically, family businesses are in unsexy industries. So we're not talking about, you know, venture capital backed technology startups in Santa Monica. We're talking about uh, a painting, a con you know, a construction, a property management, a real estate uh, development firm, uh, you know, something that's been around multi generational. Maybe, uh, you know, in my days, in my family's days, it was clothing, right. and apparel, and manufacturing. It's less and less manufacturing these days. But so I, I work with a lot of contractors and it's to provide them with a, a like a, a reference point and a playbook for how do you move forward? Because what got them here, say they, you know, the father, mother built a nice $2 million, $5 million, $10 million company, but, you know, they have aspirations to build it bigger and they, and they need to because anyone who's going to take over or buy someone else's business is going to have to grow it. Otherwise they're going to just have a job because right. um, they're going to be paying the person, you know, what their fair wage or, or, you know, they're paying a fair value for having bought the business, but they're not creating any additional value. And so my role as a business coach is to create value. And my value proposition to my clients or prospective clients is, is hire me and we'll get a three to one return on your coaching investment. And that might look like, you know, 2Xing or 10Xing your business, um, the business value. So that's, uh, that's the market that I wrote it to. And I think, uh, I think it's got some legs to it because, you know, it used to be that the next generation leader was more of a manager type. Right. You know, the father, founder, let's just be stereotyped for a second, stereotypical, you know, um, as a male founder was the entrepreneur and the driving force. And the right. next gen is like, well, I'm just going to manage this thing and I'll manage it well. But I think that there's a lot of millennials out there that really want to, you know, they, they have big dreams and um, they might become what we're, what some experts are calling uh, trans generational entrepreneurs. So that means your father was an entrepreneur and you decide not to go into that business because it's unsexy. It's not that interesting. But you decide to become a transgenerational entrepreneur, which means you are you get into some other business. Right. Uh, but you know, this is a. I think this is a you know a market that's got some legs and that I'm excited about. So. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to read it. Uh, do you see that you, you to your last comment about the transgenerational? Are you seeing? From your work or, you know, talking amongst your colleagues, are you seeing a trend more in that direction or well, a pickup in that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not seeing it so much firsthand, uh, but I've been reading a little bit about it. And I know from talking to some people, like they are in their family's business, but they're just kind of thinking like, is this really the business that I want to be in? Like, I like the business of being an entrepreneur, but I don't like this business or right. I don't like, and my, so my, I, my premise of my book is, Hey, if you're going to be a successor and a successful successor, you need to be a disruptor. And a disruptor is someone who looks at the business model. How do we innovate it? So, you know, classic example is we've got our basic retail brick and mortar store. We've got to go to e-commerce. Right. And, you know, there's uh, there are some guys out there that are buying some pretty big companies that are failing, especially now in the in the pandemic. But who but the brand is vital. So they're turning it into an e-commerce brand. So you've got to disrupt either the business model or the easier thing to do is, you know, 
improve upon the processes in the business. And that's pretty easily done. Millennials are really good with technology and apps and software and and old, you know, old school guys are not so good at that. They're not, they're not early adopters. They're not fast learners with that stuff. And that's what's going to drive efficiency in a business. So process improvements, also figure out ways to make your product or your service better. And that's about usually getting closer to your customer to find out, you know, what could we do to meet your needs better? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've talked on other podcasts and I've been right. I'm writing some, some informational pieces to, to, to your last point about, you know, COVID has brought on this, uh, you know, heightened this awareness as far as, you know, if you were running this business kind of in the analog world, the digital world is now hit you in the face, so to speak, as far as, you know, you, you need to make these changes as your point of the, you know, this disruptive successor, you know, having to go in and review the business model. And in many cases, this is how do we change from this brick and mortar or how do we modify and, you know, gravitate in and learn more about this incoming digital world, if you will. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I was an early adopter. So uh, um, I ran an organization that was a digital media networking organization. We threw events and this is, in the late nineties. So uh, it was really literally web 1.0 and we were throwing some pretty fabulous parties um, where people were coming out and we were bringing experts in subjects that weren't even like, you know, people weren't talking about yet, which was like streaming media in the late nineties. It was in its infancy. Right. And you know, how do we get to the, the last mile? And so I've always been a, pretty early adopter of of technology. And that's why I feel like I work well with younger millennial type people, because I think I can speak their language pretty well. That's great. And I, and I, and I'd have to imagine, uh, you know, this trend is going to continue. Um, and more people, you know, I hope, especially with your book are going to connect with you as far as, you know, what, you know, what it means to be a disruptive successor, because we're, if anything, you know, this year has, is, is forcing change in a lot of areas. So I, I would think, uh, I, I would think and hope, you, you know, your book is going to do quite well and it's very timely. Thank, thank you. I, I hope so as well. And, I, you know, I think one of the, the challenges that is, uh, it's not easy to bring like a, like a simple toolkit to, um, it really required, and I think I have some special experience and expertise in this, but it's the psychological family dynamics that happen. It's, it's the founder or current leader um, being able to let go and trust the next generation leader. And it's, it's cultivating wisdom and um, leadership in the next generation leader so that they're bringing some more uh, di- but bringing both discipline to their leadership, um, but bringing some fresh ideas and inventiveness. And, you know, so the, fa- the, the current leader and oftentimes the founder in, in a two generation business is, you know, they're concerned about their financial security going right. forward. Like they're 60, like they're not looking to bet the farm. But if you're 30, like you're okay with betting the farm because you got 30 years ahead of you. Right. So it's it's managing that balance, and sometimes there's a psychological rivalry between a a, a mother daughter, a, a father son, a father daughter maybe less so. But there's definitely, and then there's this letting go. You know, um, sometimes I see owners. Uh, who are the current leaders and real owners of the company, they want to transfer to the next generation, but they're using the business as kind of uh, an a- their ATM machine to right. take cash out of like more than what they're contributing. And they're not really leaving much for the, for the next uh, generation of leaders. And so the next generation leader really is going to have to drive significant growth in that business because now there's multiple families to feed and you know again they don't want they're not buying a job they're expanding a business right 
I mean, I can't imagine how challenging, you know, and you've done this for quite a while, those conversations must be um, when, you know, you know in your heart of hearts that, you know, the second generation upcoming, you know, business owners taking over, you know, has a thoughtful plan um, to make, you know, quote unquote, do these disruptive changes to the company. And the patriarch, if you will, is, like you said, more concerned about, you know, living off the farm, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes uh, with good reason, um, the next generation leader is really not ready and right. may never really have that kind of drive. Um, or it may be more of a very gradual uh, transition. And so um, you meet all kinds and you have to meet them where they are. And, you know, I mean, I think Justin is maybe, maybe he's a rare individual, but I think there's more out there like him. And I think there's people who aspire uh, to, to be a young and, you know, entrepreneurial driven leader. So. Agreed. I, look, I like, you know, I mean, it's always been great pleasure to work with companies that are making it on the Inc. 500 or 5,000 fastest growing list or, or the local business journals, you know, best places to work or fastest growing companies. Um, those leaders are usually inspiring, you know, a, a vision and bringing new leadership and purpose to a business. So those are the folks that I'm, I'm looking to speak to. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to uh, hearing more of these stories uh, and, and that uh, you discover it. It's, uh, it's great. It's great because, you know, like I've said all on, on these podcasts that the one common thread, well, there's two common threads. One is that, you know, American workers and American people are much more resilient than we give, that we're giving, we give credit to, or they give credit to themselves. I think that's important. Um, but also there's a lot, there's more positive stories or more, more things that are positive that are kind of happening maybe beneath the surface right now. Um, a lot of innovation and that, that those stories are being kind of blanketed by a lot of negative news, if you will, where, you know, whether it's COVID related or it's po political, um, you know, it's not, not everything is as negative as the news, you know, is making it seem. So I, you know, like yeah. I said, I really enjoy these conversations. Well, you know, I mean, it is a, it is a tough time, right? It is a sobering time. Um, I think this is the longest winter holiday I've ever been on. You know, it does look and feel sometimes pretty dark and bleak. Um, right. Thank God for California that we have a, a year round sunshine and we'll be able to eat outdoors, you know, all year round. Thank right. God. Right. Um, so I think that's uh, that's pretty important, um, that w and we're pretty blessed uh, yes. that we have that. So, uh, but you know what I'm what I find though is because the, my point about it being a, a long winter is that it's a great time to do some spring cleaning of your business. And so if you're a next generation leader and you're the the founder. And let's, I'm thinking of another client whose uh, dad started a company, which then morphed into a second company. And uh, my client was basically now running two companies in two different locations, one in Oregon, one in San Diego. And it was, it's been a great launching pad for him to drive new leadership, to drive new vision, and to really grow the business. Um, so... And it's, it's a business that's very viable and, and valuable today. So I think that there's a lot of entrepreneurs who have started companies. And because they were a good entrepreneur, they weren't really a good manager. So they didn't put these best practices that I teach my clients to implement. Right. They didn't put these best practices in place. And so there's a tremendous opportunity to put these practices in place and build a more scalable, valuable business. So... So I think, you know, if, if the pandemic has taught us anything is that, um, you know, make lemon, lemonade out of lemons, you know, make, uh, make hay when, uh, when the sun is shining, you know, whatever right. that metaphor is, but, <laughs> yeah. but take what you've got and make something with it. You know, you know, we, just like, I mean, personally, we are all gifted with a lot of talents. And so figure out what your talents are 
figure out what you're really good at, figure out what your contribution is, what your calling is, what you can offer and bring that forward. You know, people, we need that now. We need, we yes. need messages of hope, of inspiration, of, you know, of positivity. We, you know, everyone can be a leader. So agreed, you know, and that could be just meeting, you know, that could just be leading with a smile. You know, if you if that's all you have control over is your body and your mind, you know, then then bring your A game to work. You know, we spend a lot of time at work. You can yeah. touch a lot of people's lives. So, you know, I agree. I mean, right? I mean, sometimes our, I mean, for me, I work at home and sometimes my only contact could be with the postman or, you know, the UPS or the FedEx or Amazon delivery driver. And, you know, I mean, I can still see if he's smiling behind his, uh, his mask, I can see it in his eyes or, you know, you know, that kind of connection with people. I mean, like, like bring your A game, lead forward, you know? So, you know, whatever we're working on, whether it's your business or yourself. I'm just trying to draw an analogy. Hope it okay. makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Great, uh, great thoughts in that uh, last few moments. Thank you again. Can you talk, talk a little bit about your, your seven P's playbook? Sure. sure. Yeah. So I put together a framework. I figured that everyone needs a framework in their business. Yeah. And uh, a framework is kind of gives a common language, a, a set of tools, uh, you know, a way to speak about things. And so I start with purpose because I believe that everyone needs to get clear about what the purpose. And, you know, we always, we hear the phrase in the book by Simon Sinek, start with why. And I think it's because that's what matters so much is you have to be clear on why it is that you're doing what it is that you're doing. So we, it's, and your purpose was not your founder or maybe the current leader's purpose. You know, hopefully a purpose lasts, you know, it's everlasting through time, right. but get really clear about that. And, and that's something we did a lot of work on with Justin and his business. And when we got clear on the purpose, the culture started to really shape itself and the activities, the people that we attracted, uh, um, everything got so much better. And I could go into a lot of depth on that, but that's the, that's the first P in the, in the framework. The second P is the, is planning which is you have to sit and take some time to work on your business and think about where are you going? What is, what's the plan? What are you trying to accomplish by when, you know, what is, what's the big picture, the big overarching goals? What are your 90 day, you know, uh, six month, one year, three year, five, 10, whatever, where are we going with all this? Give me a vision, paint a picture. Um, tell me a story, you know, that's how leaders get people to follow. Then the next P is your products or your services. And how do you make them so that they're, the experience with the customer is, is better, more frictionless? You know? Um, you know, either how do you improve the, the product or, or most of my clients are service businesses. But so how do you make the, the customer experience like a 10? And just, you know, so they're telling, and you know, they're raving fans and telling other people about it. Right. Um, and then... Uh, the next P in the framework, and these don't come in necessarily any particular order, is people. Because really, to get your purpose, you probably have to start with the right people. And that, it's all about having both the right people in the right seats, doing the right things, doing them right. And then, so it's about effectiveness and efficiency, but it's also about having a healthy team that works really well together. Uh, because I'm a real believer that what Pat Lencioni said in his book that uh, it's not strategy, it's not finance, it's not technology, but it's people that is the ultimate competitive advantage. You know, you see it in sports, you and you have a great team, you know, great teams don't have to have superstars on them to basically, you know, they can win. Um, so that's the next P. Then it's priorities, which are what do you want to get accomplished by when and what are you doing to drive that kind of accountability um, then you have to have good processes. If you want to have a scalable business, it can't be people dependent. It's got to be process and system dependent. And that makes it more valuable to the next generation leader and or to the buyer of the business. And then ultimately, it's about what's the performance, which is, you know, financial performance, which is where you guys like you come in. So it's like, you know, profitability, valuation, you know, KPIs, and 
what kind of additional cash are you throwing off so that you can turn it over to your wealth manager so they can compound that value and take it outside of the business so you've you don't have all your eggs in one basket. So, so that's the framework. It's designed so anyone can two to ten x their business if they follow through it. So, thank you, for that. thank you for that. Uh, that's a great summary and uh, a lot, a lot there to to uh, digest and and think about. So, I appreciate that. Um, I've started a new uh, segment in my show in the last uh, few weeks because I felt that. You know, the get, I was peppering the guests with lots of questions, and I wanted to give the opportunity to the guests to take the uh, take the mic away or give me the mic, so to speak. And if they had any question for me, I'd be happy to uh, take a minute or two to answer. Yeah. So, you know, so I'd like you to talk about your work and the significance of it to an entrepreneur, because I'm a big believer that every entrepreneur needs to have their own boat. And a boat is a business owner advisory team. And on that boat are people that are going to create value in your business. And that would be someone like me, the business coach. There's a, a lawyer and an accountant that both uh, protects the value and distributes that value. And then there's the wealth manager who compounds and grows that value. And, you know, too many business owners that I work with, they grow from two to five to 10 to 20 million. And, you know, it's not been easy for them to recapitalize or take chips off the table. Right. Um, but they're either develop bad habits from when they were living a high lifestyle doing, you know, two and five and 10 million, and they're not putting money aside. So they need to be counseled on that. Or, if they can recapitalize, take some chips off the table and, you know, not have all their eggs in one basket. Um, the role of the wealth manager and having those conversations with those companies and I mean, those owners of those companies as they're growing is really important. So, so tell me, you know, how do you approach these conversations and, and the work and, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. Thank you. Uh, Big that's, question. I know. That's, no, uh, I, I love it. I appreciate it. It's, my, it's definitely my favorite question I've been asked so far. So thank you. So I'll, I'll take that. I'll, I'll take it in two pieces. The first part is I've always, in, in my 20 plus years of, of, of working with, whether it's small business owners or even institutions in New York, I find it that it's, it's absolutely essential that whenever I begin a relationship with any client that, that I am in connection and helping and working in collaboration with someone like yourself, the accountant, the estate planning attorney, if there's a business attorney, anybody that touches the client, we all are on the same page to as much degree as we can be. We're all collaborating. Because in the end of the day, we're all trying to provide a value to the client. And I think that value proposition, and in, in specifically in our, my, our industry, gets lost because they're worried, more concerned about you know, the assets you know, under management, if you will. Whereas the, the, it's much more important that for the client that I myself am in touch with someone like yourself or the CPA or anything that could come up of significance over time. Because as you know, they do. If the client's a family, if it's a business and they want to sell the business, it's not, you know, call up the business broker and sell it tomorrow. It's a process. And it's a process where the accountant has to be pulled in and make sure that everything on the books is the way it should appear and it's clean and it's someone like bringing in someone like yourself to review the business. So for me, like I said, it's very important that I'm always in contact with my clients, other advisors, so that if everyone's on the same page, it's, I find that it's been a pretty, you know, I don't know if seamless is the word, but it's a much more smoother ride over time to be in c contact. So I guess that's you know the, the first piece of this. The second sure. piece as far as what we've found, especially this year, uh, as an example is, you know, we look at, when I say we, I said my partners and I, we look at the world of risk versus uncertainty. 
So especially in the last 20 years, we found that the incidence of more uh, higher impact events in the financial world, if you will, both positive and negative are, have increased quite a bit, whether it's been the rise of the internet and then the, the, the bubble of the internet you know, breaking. And then it was, again, the rise in the, you know, prior to the great financial crisis. And then we had the great financial crisis. And then, you know, we built this all back up again. And then out of nowhere comes COVID-19 this year. And, and what I'm getting at is it's become too difficult to try to game risk, whereas it's much, it's not, I don't say it's not easier, but it's much more efficient that we're protecting our business owner clients against uncertainty so that whatever their life's needs are, we're matching those needs, you know, with assets that can protect those liabilities and sustain them no matter what the situation is. So again, we'd rather guard and protect against the uncertainty because that's a much more predictable story, if you will, whereas risk comes out of nowhere, right? We saw, sure. that, th- we saw that this year, case in point, you know, it, it didn't matter rich or poor where you stood, you know, there's several very substantial business owners, you know, or people that own real estate that all of a sudden became very cash poor overnight, right? They had no access to capital. Mm -hmm. They weren't able to collect rent. And then it didn't matter how many buildings or apartment units you own. But that was people in that situation were not prepared for uncertainty, right? So that's what I think if there's a message to get across is that's the one that we're we're trying to deliver on. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I guess it speaks to, uh, or you're speaking to really the diversification of your portfolio. Um, I, I've never been one personally to hold a lot of real estate because uh, I don't like the uh, the risk associated with a, an illiquid asset. Um, I'm willing to to pay the the tax on you know being able to have a liquid asset that I can trade. I mean, it's been a really interesting year this year because we've seen, uh, I mean, technology has been booming. If you owned Amazon, you know, Netflix, you know, Fang, right? right. Facebook, Am- Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, um, or you own Zoom or, you know, some, you were doing really pretty well. It, it's had some pretty deep uh, drops, but right. it's always come back, um, you know, very liquid. Uh, I, I've been invested in treasuries personally, uh, which have done really well as, as well, which is, you know, fights and, def, you know, and marrying the two of those together in ETFs has, uh, has been my secret. Um, but uh, gosh, I, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've thought about like diversifying it with real estate because you think, well, people always have to pay rent and, and they'll always be there, but there's a lot of risk associated with, you know, owning a single asset class like a home right. or a, you know, or a small, you know, multi-unit building, um, you know, I guess a REIT is safer, but yeah, this has been a really tough time, I think for, and a lot of uncertainty, but, it, but I do think it's important to have a conversation with uh, entrepreneurs early about taking some ch- uh, chips off the table. And if everything is involved in their business, I mean, you know, that's a single asset, single asset class. If they're doing well, then they could be getting a return on their net worth of north of 25%. Um, But of course it has risk, you know, you lose your key employee or, um, or if it's too dependent upon you and, you know, you get sick um, or disabled I mean, there's a lot of risk factors involved in, in smaller businesses. Um, less, less risk factors as they get larger in size. But, right. you know, but we've seen plenty of businesses get wiped out um, unexpectedly. So, yeah. Okay, so, um, so when do you start having conversations uh, with these entrepreneurs, uh, these family businesses? I mean, how early in, in it are you talking to them? Um, you know, if you will, you know, a wealth manager, I suppose, has a pretty long sales cycle. 
and they're maybe conversing with a client for a few years before they become a client. Is that is that accurate? Tell tell me a little bit about that, you. Yeah, no, the uh, great question um, and timely because uh, I actually have a case right now that kind of fits that mold. So you know, it's a he's a the the, the person I'm referring to. You know, it's a young entrepreneur um, who seems to have you know some huge tailwind behind him, but literally is starting from from ground zero, so to speak, whereas, you know, no, no real tax advisor, you know, financial person, attorney, like literally needs everything um, from soup to nuts. So mm. I'm glad I'm glad I was connected to him. Because, you know, he, he's, he's building it all right. And he doesn't have, you know, you know, free assets, if you will, yet to, you know, to invest, so to speak, to have some real asset management, if you will. But that said, you know, he's building a, you know, a successful service business. And, you know, he has a great head on his shoulders, working really hard, but he needs somebody to help quarterback all this. And I'm glad I was introduced to him now, because before everything really were to even ramp up without these advisors, you know, looking over and, and, and guiding him, if you will, I've already brought in, you know, a tax advisor to speak with him and, you know, and about to bring in another business attorney or a bit just because, you know, he's talking to me about a lot of different subjects and, and it's incumbent on, upon me to make sure that he, you know, keeps, is level headed and keeps everything organized and make sure he has, you know, people that he can, you know, pick up the phone and call upon to, you know, relay these questions as he's mm-hmm. starting before he gets so far into the weeds or down the road that, you know, for him to turn back may be very costly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, boy, I imagine you have to be really patient in your business and you have to have uh, um, a stomach to be able to wait out, you know, have an appetite to wait out a long time for someone to be in a position where they have investable assets. Uh, um, I mean, it's probably much easier to call on someone who's older, who's more established and already has the assets, but, you know, they may have already, you know, they may be more difficult to connect with or right. convince to switch. And, the, that's a many conversation thing. I, th- I mean, I look. I, I think most of us were raised to say uh, basically money, sex, politics. Those are three subjects to like steer clear of, and uh, that you know that you don't talk about. So you're wanting to talk to someone intimately about their their most like sacred or personal thing, and it's uh, right. I imagine it's a difficult conversation. So it, it, it can always be challenging, but I think it's important that, you know, and as you, and as if you've made this abundantly clear is, you know, we're not, when I say we, you and I, we're not the, the main character of the story, right? Mm-hmm. We're the, the, the main characters who we're trying to guide and help. It's all, it's what they, they drive it. It's not our, our agenda. It's their agenda. And we just try to find solutions and meet them where we can, again, you know, help them, you know, write their story, if you will. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Good stuff. Good stuff. So. Well, uh, yeah, I appreciate you asking me those uh, great questions. Thank you. Any uh, last thoughts uh, you'd like to conclude with here? Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like, you know, the greatest businesses that lasted, uh, let me rephrase this. There were many great businesses that were formed out of the 1929 Great Depression. And this is probably, you know, this seems bigger than the financial crisis of 2008. This certainly seems a lot bigger than the, the dot-com, gone dot-com bomb, you know, implosion of uh, 1999, 2000. Um, and yet, this is still a great opportunity to be able to build a valuable, lasting, scalable, sustainable business. Um, it you know, might be more difficult to raise capital in today's environment, um, but most people don't 
start their businesses with with capital uh, from outside sources other than family and friends. Um, but this is a great opportunity to try and innovate and either build something better or get something started. Um, or if you're in the, you know, if you're looking at your family's business and saying, like, I could be really building this into something much better because, uh, you know, my parents just really aren't like, they're not leveraging current stuff. They're not using current thinking, current technology. And, um, you know, this is a great opportunity. So see this and the world as your oyster and figure out how to make a pearl out of it. Just takes a piece of sand, you know, and it takes some like hard work, you know, that sand, you know, gets rubbed multiple times off of that shell before right. it for, forms into a pearl. Um, and, you know, just do it as Nike said. That's right. And, well, uh, and choose wisely. Right. So may not be the time to start a hospitality or a restaurant or, a, you know, a, a travel type uh, related business. But certainly it's a great time to think about taking an existing business and making it more e-commerce friendly. Absolutely. Making it more customer frictionless. So that's my well, message. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for your time, Jonathan. Uh, it was great to see you. Learned a ton. Uh, I, I know our viewers will learn a ton from this. Uh, really excited for your, for your book. Um, look forward to, to reading that when it, uh, when it's available. And again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah. Thanks you. Uh, for people who want to check out my book, they can go to a new website I'm just putting up called disruptive successor.com. It'll be available on Amazon October 27th. And, uh, yeah. You, and if anyone has any questions, wants to reach me, I can be reached at John J O N at the gold Hill group.com. So. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you everyone for being here with us today. Uh, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel, smash the like button. We'll be back with another episode next week. Uh, again, my name is Hugh Meyer. This is Money Talks. Have a great day. Take care.